thanks for your time. My name's Dan Sloan. I'm with Baldwin White Architects. And uh, I won't spend a lot of your time today going through what you might think are really nice, uh, beautiful pictures. You're actually going to be able to see a project from an architect's eyes. And uh, don't be surprised if you're faint of heart, you may need to leave now. Because basically when you work as an uh, architect or any sort of designer, you need to look at things differently. You need to basically be able to take something apart and figure it out, well, how do you put it back together again? And so what you'll see is the back of house. You'll see how buildings work. You'll see how the Saarinen building works. The, we're going to be talking about the quads, residence halls. And they're basically uh, Stallmaker, Crawford, Carpenter, and Harriet. As you know, they have the wonderful bridges that run across. They connect over to Hubble. And we'll really be focusing this morning's time just talking about the quads because this is the project that we most recently renovated. I have a team member in the audience. I think Susanna, are you still here? There she is, Susanna Costin. She actually was the lead architect. We had a team of six architects that worked on this project at one time. You have to realize four buildings, 120,000 square feet. How do you accomplish that in a short amount of time? And plus, you have to keep a school operational. You have to be able to maintain uh, the livelihood of the institution. And you still have to attract new students at the same time. A lot of this is really about marketing. How do you put your best foot forward? And so as we're going to spend a little bit of time now walking through the projects, just keep in mind we're going to be looking at this from code compliance, handicap accessibility. These are just pretty pictures. Uh, handicap accessibility and then building integrity. Uh, Jason touched on at the chapel a few of the nuances that happen with time on such a small building and it can actually get scary. Think in terms of large buildings. We have four buildings that with maintenance over time and just the nature of the beast being a modern building, they have very minimalist details. I mean, we're talking if things are off or the caulking is missing in some area, water can enter into a building and just basically start to destroy it. And so when I talk about inside out, literally, these buildings were destroying themselves from the inside out. And we're going to show you a few uh, details that you might have saw yesterday at the uh, presentation where we saw some real interesting building sections. And you, maybe you perceived how thin the buildings are. When I mean thin, literally, you, you go into your home and you have a wall and you have insulation, you have that protective element. These buildings are built mass production, literally slab, tilled up slab with brick veneer on the outside. There's a three inch gap in between the outside concrete wall and the brick veneer. Metal channels hold up, you'll see going around the perimeter. Thanks, Peter. Go around the perimeter. Get the clip. Thank you. Each one of the metal channels Every floor, they're not attached directly to the concrete slab. They're actually pulled away. And there's a clear gap from top to bottom in all the buildings. It's a, literally a rain wall, if you will. And the water, as it enters the top of the building, will come all the way down to the end. In this case, you won't be able to find it, but you'll be able to see there's some weeps at the lowest angle where the water will come out again. Well, what happens as water enters, enters in, in areas where windows here, you're going to start seeing some damage all the way through. And we're going to show you some rather uh, unattractive photographs, but it's just part of the process. Uh, what's interesting for me is basically, uh, I was a student at Drake University several years ago. It was long enough ago that the buildings were only 15 years old. Wonderful, fantastic, we loved them. We, a lot of things went off the bridges, I think they probably still do. <laughs> Little did I know I'd be coming back years later to rebuild the bridges. And the same with the plans, the upcoming plans for Hubble Dining Hall. That's where my student job was. And within that area, many times, I can tell you every in and out of that building from top to bottom. It's just part of your life. It's amazing how things go full circle. And so on this university's campus alone, uh, I'm going to get off base a little bit here, but I want to tell you that uh, at the time of, uh, I attended university, we had, I think, four new buildings go up at the same time. We had Fine Arts Building, we had the Law Building, Olmsted, Olin, and I think there might have been one more at the same time, all constructed through the vision of that particular president and that also the building committee. Same is true nowadays. The plans for the quads really aren't just arbitrary. Of course, it's part of marketing where you need to make sure you have the best facilities for your freshman housing. But it really is the vision of the president and the building and grounds, of the vice president, uh, treasurer with Vicki Pacer. You have people in mind that understand to maintain the vitality of your university, you have to keep changing, you have to keep improving. And so the quads, which are all freshman housing for over, eight, excuse me, over 800 kids, were desperately in need of upgrade. And if there's any student in here uh, that might have had, could see a show of hands, that might have been in the quads before they were renovated, you'll, you'll see some photographs. You might recognize some of your rooms. I don't know if you've been in the lower levels. Just shake your head or you just put your head down, that's fine. 
but basically they live through the experience and they, they'll know for sure they went from the original where it is to hopefully what you enjoy now. And so with that in mind, I just love the shot of the bridge. Uh, I, I probably had a few things that happened down there. For, fortunately back then as a fine art student, the sculpture major, things are foggy. I don't remember where things landed, but I do remember it was a heck of a lot of fun. One more shot of the bridges. Then we're just gonna talk about accessibility. Again, this is from an architect's point of view, so bear with me. You always think about the campus in terms of how you get into a building. The same today, you probably wondered, as you entered into the lobby. If you're in any sort of accessibility issue, you have to be able to go from point A to point B. And uh, usually on campus, it's easy to do. But, oh, so you get up to the bridges, and you're gonna start seeing a few roadblocks. This is just nature, the codes have changed over the years. Uh, needs have changed over the years. And then, one little roadblock. And this will go on several slides the same way. You're gonna to try to enter the bridge to go over to Crawford. Steps and a step. Steps and a step. Seems mundane, but it's so critical. Every entrance, every door. And the renovation of the, these four buildings happened two buildings at a time over two summers in three months time period. Now, I, I see that some heads, Steve's smiling because he knows what this means. What this meant is that every element, for instance, the entrance doors and the glass long side, all the, all the shop drawings had been pre-approved, all the elements pre-purchased. Now think about in terms of when Saarinen built these buildings in the first place. It's probably the same mass production. Well, we had to do the same thing to rebuild them. Everything pre-purchased, warehouse, all ready to go, so at time of construction, they were ready to be put in. Every door. I think, Susanna, these are probably your photographs. You probably just, oh, there we go. Now we get into the building. We're, we're all adaptable. We have to make do and things we can improve on. Now, once you get inside the building, how do you get up and down? We're, we're four, four stories up, four stories down. Accessibility. This is the dumbwaiter. It really was uh, obviously just removing clothes up and down to the lower level laundries. But maybe this would be one way we could adapt because people are adaptable. We'd be able to retrofit back in and be able to do a lift for the chairs. Restrooms. Oh, where do you start? Restrooms, bathrooms, showers, tubs, you name it. Even the, uh, the desk itself at the front. Sensitivity to access, sensitivity to um, accessibility. This is a, actually, I think this was Carpenter. You can see through Carpenter looking to the north. They've had the pot machines on the left and the, uh, the desk, which really is the original desk that's been retrofitted with a paint job. And then just basic things, water fountains, drinking fountains, life safety as you get in through the building. This was it. Every building on campus now, the, the goal has been to bring up in terms of the dorms up, up to life safety standards. We have just went through and completed the renovation of Morehouse and Jewett uh, with sprinkler systems. All four of these buildings, we inserted sprinkler systems within this very tight envelope and without concealing or without exposing the pipes. So that alone was just a challenge in itself because we're gonna see pipes in a little bit. You'll be amazed the amount of pipes you see. The life safety in this case, you'll see down the corridor. Uh, in this case, was just merely the smoke detector looking down through the hallway. Fun things, Saren and details. Fortunately, as you approach projects and, uh, and you look at code compliance, if you're really careful in about the amount of area that you renovate and working with the existing building codes, a lot of things can stay in place. So we're gonna show you some details that we were able just to leave alone. And this is one fun one, right alongside the window wall on the, uh, the balcony overlook, uh, down to the second level. There's a four inch gap there, no problem. Oh, there were a few railing missing. Now think about this today. You know today's standards, you need to have four inch space between your railings. All this was able to remain in place because the way the project was handled with the existing building code. And uh, it would have been, in our mind, the most difficult decision to try to have to renovate or retrofit this railing system on the inside. It's such a strong dynamic on how these interiors work. And then on the exterior of the bridges, uh, the bridges we'll talk about a little bit, but basically it was the hardest decision I think I'll ever come through in my career. We had to take the bridges down. Uh, they were found structurally unsound. They actually swayed when you walked on them. We had to do additional bracing. The uh, uh, steel members had uh, uh, effaced to the point there was not, not enough uh, structural integrity left in the main uh, beams themselves. So eventually the bridges had to, get come, uh, had to come down, we had to rebuild them. That was a very hard decision. We uh, a lot of anxiety, but uh, it had to be done. You can see the beauty of them though. Clean, simple, 
basically to the point. Pipes, why am I showing you this? Um, you'll see in the two seconds. Looking again back at the section, uh, back at the uh, uh, Mars display, you're, you might remember they're, they're showing pipes coming down through a pipe, for, through a tunnel. Well, that's good in theory on a drawing, but sometimes it just doesn't happen in the field. We all enc encounter this, and we, so we always try to get around it the best we can. But in this case, this would be typical for all four buildings. You have to be able to serve every one of the radiators, every one of the uh, heating devices for all the rooms are over 800 students, so you started seeing pipes show up. These are heating pipes, large ones. You're on the ground level right now, and uh, old hold back from the old original days would have been your uh, trunk room, now a storage room, but pipes. And there's more pipes. Oh, there's your kitchen. Think about marketing. How do you get students to come to your campus? This is all about what is the best freshman experience you can provide, and how do you keep your kids once they're here? This isn't it. And so part of our obligation and our vision as we listen to the, um, the interview process is basically, what can we do? How can we help? How can we make a student's life better while they're here? Oh, there's your rec room. Now, the, the challenge why I, I can take absolutely no credit for it is really quite clever, is obviously you still need all the pipe to serve all the, all the, the heating devices through the building. So what do you do with them? Tunnels are full, no place for them, so the solution is basically arrived at, you'll take the pipes, restack them to the exterior wall, regain your headroom, and make this into a usable space once again. Take you out of the basement mentality into a finished floor. And we're able to gain every building an entire finished floor, uh, which at one time was just merely semi-used. And then, of course, as you get into the pipes, you have to go up and down through the building. So in a typical student's room, this would be your closet. You'd have vertical risers. And then through your shower, you might have some pipes. Oh, they're there in the bathroom again. On and on, on and on. They're there in the uh, stairway, and let's hide them. Let's do a bulkhead, let's hide them. We can do better. But what are all the pipes serving? Basically, through all the, uh, every room, if you look right down here, very small fin tube radiator. If you saw the student mock-up, by the way, for the students that did the mock-up in the, 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 uh, the original room, it was awesome. I loved it. We had the original bench still there. That was job well done. Uh, there's the original bench. And on either side, you'll see this looks like a piece of metal. That's exactly what it is. And right there's a little control valve. That is a radiator for every room. You're able to turn that on and off, high or low, to be able to heat that room. Now think about it. These are old steel windows, single glaze. If you live in an old house, you want single glaze windows for like in the wintertime? What happens if you get too hot? They start sweating. So let's, enter, let's put a lot of heat at the bottom of these windows and find out what happens. So the heat comes up, windows sweat. I'm going to give you one guess what happens to steel windows when they start sweating in the wintertime. It doesn't quite look like that student room we saw last night. I think I like the student room better. There's the radiator again. There it is taken apart. What's missing here? That is actually the back side of the brick, the outside wall. This area is about eight inches wide, and there's a three inch cavity back there, and that's the concrete tilled up right here. And that's the radiator system with the piping that goes all the way through where you saw those horizontal lines running in the lower level. The challenge, of course, how do you make a building watertight? How do you serve all these rooms? How do you provide air conditioning, which we're bringing into every one of the rooms? and do it in such a manner that we can b get the building brought back to its original integrity. Part of the uh, challenge that was placed to us when we first started the project, we have to maintain the integrity of the Serenin design. And uh, so hopefully you'll find at the very end that we were able to provide that. This is actually, uh, we didn't pull this apart. Right in there is that cavity we just looked at from the inside. Now we're looking inside out again. The bottom of the window, the panel, and the, right behind that is the radiator. The important detail here is that is the back edge of the brick. Behind that is air. That is the edge of the window. Behind that is air. Right there, that cock joint is what ties the two together. If the cock joint fails, what do you think happens? Rust, rust. Oh, pretty soon we start seeing some masonry damage. And this went on and on. Another detail we looked at was the, the channels that run around the entire uh, building. It's actually a hard border joint between the steel and the, the masonry. They move differently. They're going to crack in between. It's going to let water into the building. 
So every one of those channels had to be cut out and soft joints put in. I'm sorry, there's a lot of pretty pictures. This is what it's all about. This is our, our job is basically to say, how do you solve these problems? And what does happen on the large, lovely social rooms? Same challenge. The very the fantastic window walls. Uh, if you see a little bit of shiny there, that's actually retrofitted steel, uh, aluminum placed onto that to try to hold that back together. And from the inside, you can start seeing the rest coming back through again. And there, there is from the bottom. And the original photographs of that would be the Stallnaker social room. The biggest heartbreak was the bridge. And the bridge is your, every element, if you take them closer look, this is just, you know, superficial small. But as you got closer into the, the support mechanism for the bridge as it even went onto its haunch as, as it decayed and rusted. And on the underside, when you marry two different materials together, such as wood with steel, wood holds water. Steel does not like water. And so basically in between the two, you're going to get rust. The entire span all the way through where the two were married together, which is all the way, uh, was decayed. And so basically you'll see that in the middle of uh, summertime, we fought with this internally. We worked through this with the structural engineer, tried our best. We had to be able to rebuild these bridges in time, get classes started. Uh, it finally got to the point there was literally no way to save them. And so that's what happened. They had to come down. And within a short amount of time, all the pieces were already rebuilt. We brought them back out in 50-foot uh, sections. They were replaced back together again. Brought up the current cord standards, 42-inch uh, high with the 4-inch spacing. Uh, this is still galvanized, and uh, so basically, if you notice at the open spot right there at the bottom, each one of those, they're left open so they don't rust again like they did previously. Balconies, the connecting ties between the two buildings, same issue, but in this case, we're able just to remove the superficial steel along the edge and then replace all the wood with galvanized planking, which we used on the new bridges to keep them intact, and so we were able to save uh, the connecting balconies, but you can start seeing the impact then on the masonry and the damage that happens with minimal details. Uh, edge of concrete, which is the roof system for the social room, face brick, absolutely no, uh, no chance for clearance in between the two. They are literally are flush, and if that joint fails, you get water in behind, and you can see it starts to take the face of the bricks off. And as it works down through the building, this is what happens. What was important for us as we went through the process really to look at this from the inside from a student's point of view and uh, your view to the outside. And so it was critical that as we got into construction that no matter what we did, we were always thinking about as we put it back together, your final product. Uh, see the edge of the brick? That's the actually the outside of the building of the original channel that I just showed you where all the piping runs through. Uh, the reinforcement was necessary because this would be, a, excuse me, this would be a place where we went through and inserted an elevator in each of the buildings and then to be able to support the slab, which is a cast in place slab uh, during construction. The building actually, the, the project was its most exciting, I think, when, we, when the windows came out. You were able to experience the building as it was during construction uh, some 50 years ago. Literally, you stood inside and you looked from one side to the out, no windows. It was an amazing, it stayed cool. Obviously, there was a breeze going through, but all you had around you was concrete above, concrete aside, and then nothing in between. Uh, you truly felt what Serena must have felt when he was in the middle of this during construction. And then the window replacement process going back in, you can see some tuck pointing happening. Uh, original windows are on the top two floors being installed, and then the uh, lower level still have the originals. Uh, window replacement system, it's a double glazed insulated unit. It is aluminum. Uh, we did not go back to a metal. A metal, we had a uh, scheduling issues, being able to get it in on time. We have long-term maintenance issues with it. And then also just cost. It's more expensive. And then the profile itself, we were then challenged, to how do you find a deep enough profile to be able to grab from the outside of that brick, or excuse me, the inside of the brick back in to get some structural integrity back into the building again. So our, our, our goal really was to find a unit that had a narrow enough profile, keep the color slightly darker than what it was originally, so it diminishes the, your, your uh, perception of the window mull itself. And then also use a zero sight line vent. What that means is typically uh, a sash at your home, you'll see the wood going around it, or the, if you live in a modern house, the metal going around it. In this case, it's called a zero sash line. They're not installed yet, but uh, on the next photographs, you're going to be seeing that in this area, 
where on the original windows you'd see a little bit of metal, but it had a very small profile here. Let's see if I can find one. There it is. The new vents now are glass all the way around, so there isn't the additional metal that would diminish from the appearance, I think, of the original concept. And tuck pointing in process, uh, you can see slowly putting the buildings back together again. It starts feeling a little more safe, a little more secure. Crawford before construction. Crawford during construction. Social room, same issue. Uh, viability to be able to salvage the, the wood. Actually above the wood there's additional fin tube, additional radiators. There's insulation that was uh, applied at one time. Uh, it was not salvageable, uh, considerable water damage to it. It did not allow access to any of the equipment up above. So we had to come up with a system that was interchangeable as a wood louver system of the same profile that's there. And uh, so that meant it had to come down. You can see the original structure. Uh, actual steel beams are underneath the, the large uh, members you see going across there encased in concrete. And then more of a final photograph for you showing the wood ceiling reinstalled. Uh, the ceiling uh, put back together again, the windows put back together again, the furniture selection. Uh, this is a, uh, a large team of folks that put this project together for us. And uh, so again, the stallmaker from the outside, Crawford from the inside, I believe. A few more shots. Uh, I love the fact that our color palette on the original was very similar to our final palette in terms of this muted tones, earth tones, and some blacks and uh, connecting bridges. Looking back, last one with the uh, bridges towards Crawford and upcoming project which will be Hubble. Uh, we're looking at the interior of the Hubble on the north side which is the Saarinen side. Uh, it is still original if you went into that particular facility. It is unchanged since it was 30 years ago. Has not changed. Uh, basically it has original sloped ceiling, the original food line, service line. And uh, the job will be to maintain the, in the architectural integrity from the interior as the well of making it adaptable for a recent, uh, more modern, if you want to use the term, uh, food service appropriate for today's students. And um, hopefully be able to go through into the exterior so it now is also brought up to the uh, same integrity that the, the quads have. Other project that we're looking at is the, actually it's the auditorium uh, over here at Harvard Ingman. And being able to be able to bring it up to standards, I think, that are appropriate for day, today's teaching standards and uh, for different type of classroom, different type of interaction between students. So that's the things that are going on on campus. It's a very exciting time to be here. And uh, as a former student, it's always proud to come back again. So any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.